Welcome to Proven Improbable, where we deliver mining insights and bullion sales in the form of physical delivery, offshore depositories, and private blockchain distributed ledger technology. Welcome to Proven and Probable. I'm your host, Maurice Jackson. We thank you for joining us on a special four part series entitled All About Private Placements. Joining us for a conversation is Tokoa Da Silva. He is an accomplished, licensed financial advisor for Sprott. USA, the preeminent name in the natural resource space. Full disclosure, the following is not a Sprott USA endorsed product, and it is for educational purposes only. Mr. De Silva, thank you for joining us today. Hi, Maurice. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here as well. You know, there's a lot of ambiguity regarding private placements, and we thought it would be good for our subscribers to have the most comprehensive uh, overview regarding these. Now, as a full disclosure for our audience members, this is for educational purposes only. Should you have a specific request, uh, we will provide correspondence at the end of the presentation so you can ask those questions directly. Tokoa, what is a private placement? Sure. Uh, well, uh, a private placement, uh, my understanding is that it's simply a vehicle that's used to allow a investor to fund directly a corporate entity. Uh, I I think I'm, I'm guessing in the context of this conversation, private placements uh, is probably in relation to natural resources and mining industries. And uh, I believe it, it the bottom two segments of that industry, exploration and development stage uh, businesses, that's their sort of lifeline. Uh, their lifeline in terms of their primary source of uh, capital infusion is private placements. So a private placement again is a way for an investor, typically an accredited investor, um, thinking from the U.S. and North American context, an accredited investor is someone with a net worth of one million dollars or more, excluding the value of their main residence. There's also an income part of that too, uh, which changes over time. A person can look that up uh, online. But uh, a private placement is a vehicle used to move cash directly into the entity, and then in exchange for you ca- uh, for your cash, you get some form of security or ownership. And uh, the securities that you could get could be common stock, they could be stock options, warrants, uh, debt securities. So uh, that is what a private placement generally is. So it allows you to get either shares or a debenture. Yes, sir. Now, how do I participate in a private placement as an investor or speculator, I should say, more particular? Sure. Uh, So assuming that we're talking about the North American context and if you are, let's say, based in the U.S. uh, and accredited an investor, how would you participate in a private placement? I think uh, if a person is sitting in front of a computer at home and they see a press release come up for, let's say, uh, a gold exploration company and they look at it and it says the company is announcing a private placement and they say how do I participate in that probably the first thing that person would do or could do is to call the company or email them and say I'd like to participate if they do and what would happen next is the company would um, would, they would reply and probably provide a few documents Uh, a private placement memorandum is uh, the lead document And they would provide that to the person to complete and return, and that would start the process of participating in a private placement. The investor relations personnel at that company would uh, sort of hold your hand and walk you through the process at that point. Now, what are the requirements to participate in a private placement? Because it can't just be a a lay investor. There has to be certain credentials that you must meet. Sure. The requirements to participate in a private placement, uh, again, from the North American context, is usually firstly being an accredited investor. So having a net worth of US uh, 1 million or more, excluding the value of your main residence. Uh, There's also an income qualification part of it too that may change over time. So you always wanna look online for the most precise definition announced by it's, I believe it's the SEC or uh, FINRA in the United States. That's usually the case. Sometimes there will be offerings that don't require an, an, an investor or a speculator to be accredited. But those are uh, different types of offerings, and you'll want to check with the company uh, to ask about the specific type of offering that they have. So that's the, the first hurdle. 
There are other hurdles uh, that a person should consider, um, and they have to do with participation amounts and also third-party processing fees. My experience is that it's usually between three to six hundred dollars are the process, third-party processing fees, not including a brokerage commission cost that a person may encounter if they participate in a private placement. So, if you're considering an investment or a speculation in something, and your hurdle is three to six hundred dollars just to process it, and let's say another one or two percent as a brokerage commission cost or the market value of the investment and you're thinking about it for $5,000 or $10,000, I mean, really, if it's $5,000 or less and you're putting up 10, 15% of your capital just to play, uh, in most cases, I think that's pretty unreasonable. But uh, if you increase the amount and it's 10, 15,000 US or, or larger, uh, then that, that friction is smaller as a percentage of your capital and maybe it's more considerable. So, uh, so you, you, you have your technical requirement in, in, in terms of being financially qualified and the specific type of offering that the company is making available to the market. You have your financial requirement, your qualifications there. And then outside of that, it's just going through, uh, jumping through the hoops, if you will, and completing the paperwork and moving the paperwork uh, around to the various uh, parties. And uh, when, this is the multi-million dollar question really is, when is it a good time to buy? When is it a good time to buy? Boy, that's such a good question. Um, I, I, I think there's probably two answers. The first one is uh, anytime's a good time to buy depending on the terms of the deal and the quality of the company. Uh, because you may have a really good company uh, which maybe is comprised of two basic things like a management team as well as a collection of assets or uh, income streams and such, um, and you, you just might come across a good deal. So anytime could be a good time, I think, in that sense, uh, when looking at quality in terms. But um, the second answer, I think, is really dependent on the cost of capital, market conditions. Uh, I always interpreted a stock market going up or down as just thinking about it as stocks going up and stocks going down. but. You know, there is this uh, phrase that uh, our good friend and I think mutual mentor, uh, Mr. Rick Rule, taught us, which is uh, the cost of capital. And now I come to interpret uh, stock markets moving up or down as being the cost of capital, either, either declining or increasing. So when you have dropping stock prices, you have an increasing cost of capital, the seesaw, the office, the thinking of the opposite end. And then when you have surging share pricing, you have a dropping of cost of capital for the issues. So ideally, uh, a buffet, a feast, if you will, is usually during the market, during a market context in which you have a, an absolute liquidation, uh, where there's a panic, a shortage of capital a, across an entire sector or an entire market. And when we're looking at the context of resource markets where Natural resource exploration and development stage companies are generally non-income non producing companies. So they live on, uh, let's say, uh, blocks of capital that may be between 9 to 18 months, where every time they do a private placement, they're simply buying time to continue their business activities. So if you have a, a period of, let's say, 2008, 2009, during that market crash, coinciding with a uh, period of a, a, a of a small exploration company of the corporate treasury running down toward two three four months of capital remaining in the bank that's an ideal context to be a capital provider uh, to a host of companies that are in that circumstance why is it ideal one because they need the money most desperately at that time so you'll they're in a position which they want to negotiate and then second, your competition has been cleared from the field. Very few people want to buy shares of anything in that context, and let alone shares in a company that can be illiquid for a period of time that they have to commit a large amount of capital to, which is a non-income non producing high risk business. So uh, the two part answer to the question is again, anytime is a good time to buy a private placement provided that you have high quality management team, a high quality basket of assets at, at good terms, 
which is probably a separate uh, question of what are good terms. That's the first thing, uh, you know, part of the answer. And then the second uh, is market clearing events can be wonderful opportunities to buy any assets, but certainly buying assets by a private place. You know, maybe something we should have covered before is in your experience, is it usually junior mining companies or is it just the mining companies as a whole? And let's backtrack that question as well is, can you distinguish the difference between what is a junior mining company? Uh, because you somewhat alluded to it and sometimes we get confused on the difference between a mining company and a junior mining company. Sure. You know, there's a, uh, a really smart gentleman that uh, works uh, here at Sprott uh, and his name is Mr. Jeff Howard. I once walked into his office and I asked him that very question. And uh, he explained to me uh, uh, a, a conversation that he called uh, the four asset classes of mining. And uh, he explained it to me that you've got four asset classes. Uh, you've got your major producers, you've got your junior producers, your junior development stage companies, and then your junior exploration stage companies. Four categories. Majors at the top and then juniors generally populate those three bottom categories. You may have a mid-tier that populates that uh, second category down, the uh, junior producer with, let's say, one, two, or three producing mines. But if it's one producing mine, depending on the size of the mine, it's, you probably want to consider it to be a junior. Uh, so does that answer that uh, question? It does. And I think just to, just for additional clarification, so the junior mining company is actually not extracting anything out of the ground. And like you referenced, it's a research and development exercise. So if they're not extracting anything out of the ground, they're not able to generate revenue. And that's where the terms come in, where you can really make it a lucrative endeavor for yourself here. So let's talk about some of the terms. What are private placement terms? Sure. Uh, the, terms, the terms are what you get in exchange for your money. And if you're looking at a press release that a company has put out about a private placement, you always want to look at the first and second paragraph where the terms are usually spelled out. So uh, private placements, again, in the North American context of natural resource uh, exploration, you know, uh, natural resource industries, in that first and second paragraph, they'll, use, they'll usually reference something that they call a unit. I would imagine a unit like a shell, an eggshell. You pop it open, and there's usually something inside. Uh, on the inside, there could be one thing or sometimes two things. There should always be, uh, if you're buying shares, there should be one common share inside that shell. Sometimes they'll add something extra, uh, a warrant of some kind. Uh, a warrant is similar to a stock option. Uh, it gives an individual the right to buy an additional uh, piece of common stock at a specified price during a specified duration of time, and then it expires afterwards. So a, uh, private, a set of private placement terms could be something like this. A unit, a shell, priced at 10 cents Canadian. And inside the shell, you've got two pieces. Uh, one is a common share, and the second piece is a, a full warrant. And I say full warrant because sometimes it could be a half warrant or some other fractional kind of warrant. But we'll just say a full warrant. So you've got a 10 cent unit, which includes one common share and then one warrant on the inside. And the warrant, let's assume, is exercisable at a 15 cent Canadian share price for a five year period. So that's what they would call a five year warrant. Exercisable at 15 cents for a five year period. And this shell is priced, this unit is priced at 10 cents Canadian. And let's just hypothetically assume also that the price of the common shares in the market may be trading at 10, 11, or 12 cents Canadian. So that's a uh, maybe a typical set of private placement terms that you may see in a public press release. But these days, because market conditions are a bit more buoyant, capital is generally available, you don't as often see five-year full warrants. You more often see 12-month, 24-month uh, warrants, and quite often uh, 12 and 24-month half warrants, uh, as opposed to like a full five-year warrant. And yeah, let's, let's backtrack here slightly here. In your experience, uh, in this hypothetical scenario where the unit is being offered at 10 cents, that's usually at a discount of what it is on the current market price. Is that your experience? 
It may be. Uh, it depends on the appetite that is in the market for that issue. Uh, if the cost of capital is a bit higher, they may offer it at a discount. If the cost of capital is temporarily low, like if there are surging prices, that uh, placement unit may be offered at a premium to market because the market may really want that warrant and they're willing to pay extra for it. Or the unit may match the price uh, of the market. So it, it, it really depends on market conditions and it depends on the people that the issuing company, the groups that they're tapping for capital. It could be uh, like a, uh, a number of specialist natural resource and brokerage firms. It could include newsletter publishers, uh, other types of um, you know, uh, capital raising groups. The more interest there is, uh, of course, the lower the cost of capital or the worse the terms for the investor or speculator and the better the terms are for the issue. Now, Tako, I don't want to brag on myself, but I'd like to give a hypothetical, not a hypothetical, but a real life scenario here. So two years ago with a company, uh, Novo Resources, they they conducted a financing and it was at uh, 66 cents and then you had a full warrant one year at 90 cents and what occurred with the company and we issued that uh, financing opportunity to our subscribers what occurred was uh, Novo Resources within four months jumped to eight dollars and fifty five cents that is a one thousand four hundred percent return however if you participated in the financing then you were able irrespective of the current price you were able to purchase the same quantity of shares that you purchased originally at 66 cents, you could purchase them at 90 cents. And that's the value proposition that we're trying to convey to you regarding private placements. I have one more question for you, and that is, what determines private placement terms? What determines the terms? Well, I think it's a, it's kind of like a combination between cost of capital conditions in the marketplace in the bidding atmosphere that is generated as a result and the negotiating technique of both sides. Uh, it, I think, can be competitive. I, 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 haven't, I have to tell you that I haven't sat in on many private placement negotiations myself, uh, watching two parties go at it. Uh, I'm usually one layer away from most of those direct negotiations, but I've seen some of them take place. I've been uh, very close to and have participated in conversations uh, in agreeing on price. And uh, it can take as little as a few minutes uh, of getting a sense of what both parties feel is reasonable, uh, or it can be sort of um, a more heated negotiation uh, as as some other people uh, in the market may reference. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes part one on the value proposition of private placements. If you wish to have a conversation with Mr. Tacoa De Silva, please email tdasilva at sproutglobal.com. If you wish to find out which private placements have our attention at Proven and Probable, simply visit provenandprobable.com. Place your correspondence in the subscribe box and let us know that you're accredited. Subscription is free, and we do not share your correspondence with third parties. The information presented on Proven and Probable is provided for educational and informational purposes only, without any express or implied warranty of any kind, including warranties of accuracy, completeness, or fitness for any particular purpose. The information is not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice, or any other advice. You should not make any financial, investment, or trading decision based on any of the information presented without first undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional broker or competent financial advisor.